Thank you, Stephanie, very much for that talk. I really enjoyed how you linked together the disparate data synthesis, open science and collaboration with recent events and also putting the positive outlook for what we can think about and do in the future. So that was great, I appreciate that. Um, for the audience and the attendees, I hope that you enjoyed Stephanie's talk and like to open up for question and answers for the next 20 or so minutes. I can see that we have some questions coming into the Q&A and some people have also posted questions in the chat box. Please um, put your questions in the Q&A. So if you did put a question in the chat box, please copy and paste it into the Q&A window. And then for those who are looking at the Q&A window, you're able to um, upvote a question by I think clicking on the thumbs up button. So those questions that receive more and more votes will go to the top and those will be the ones I'll focus on. So uh, yeah, please uh, enter some questions. I see that some are arriving here, which is great. And let's see, where should we start? Um, I guess we can start with this first one from Jonathan Miller, Stephanie. Um, you mm -hmm. mentioned a human-centered approach. With that in mind, how can you best communicate with the public at a time when a lot of people show a mistrust of science and little understanding of data? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think there's a, a little bit of a, a framing. Uh, it's an excellent question. And, but there's a little bit of the framing that I'd like to think about too, because I, I, I mean, maybe this is my reflexive positivity <laughs> showing up. But you know, the 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 um, Pew's uh, survey on public trust uh, last uh, last year at the end of last year still showed that the the public has strong trust in the scientist and and certainly a lot can change over time and we know that there are you know certain issues where we have real problems um, but I, I think it's worth it to to keep in mind so that it doesn't seem like such a scary proposition that we need to drop in and and really fix a big problem um, so I think that you know people can we can all uh, approach our interactions with the public with the positive outlook, knowing that there is some basic trust in, in scientists. Um, having said that, certainly there are some areas where we see it as a, as a real problem, and, and I understand that. Um, I, I think, you know, for me, I've gotten a lot out of being able to get some training on, um, on communication, and, uh, you know, and that has been, you know, lucky lucky for me to uh, have been able to do a number of compass workshops um, but even you know if you don't have access to those uh, there's lots of resources online that uh, show you how to frame your your messages in ways that are a little more compelling to the public if you're talking if you have an opportunity to talk to a journalist um, but also really you know when you have an opportunity to uh, speak at a you know at at your church or in um, you know, parents groups. Um, I think that each of us has a sphere of influence where uh, we can we can work to improve the understanding of science and also the the trust in scientists and help the public to see us as the human beings we are. <laughs> um, but I do. I also think it's really uh, critically important to be really honest about what we know and what we don't know, and to remain open minded. And, um, and to view it as a dialogue with the public, not, not us giving, giving information, but us really finding out uh, from them what they wanna know um, and, um, and also sharing with us information that'll change the way that we think about our issues. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, there are a couple of questions here in a row that um, revolve around collaboration, but I'm gonna kind of break them down first. So Bob Newman has, I wanna, ask you the first part of his question, and then we'll delve more into the collaboration part. He says, what is the minimum training needed for today's ecology students to be effective in meeting the scaling challenges we are tackling? Yeah, you know, um, so I think that a, a, a really important first step is in demystifying uh, data, working with data. And I, I you know, I think, Many of us have familiarity with uh, software carpentry and data carpentry workshops, which are typically these 
know, two day workshops that might focus on getting us more familiar with working in a scripted language and doing a little lightweight data management. And even though it's only two days and it's a little bit superficial, I think one of, one of the, maybe the most important thing that I've seen in running these at our universities has been that the, the trainees find out that they can do it and so they're not scared of jumping in and doing it and they know what the entry point is and then there's such an amazing community online who can answer questions and really engage and are getting so much better about you know not answering you with things like well go read the manual <laughs> you know we're really seeing a very supportive community and i think especially among ecologists um, so i think you know, we go into in our um, the bioscience paper that I mentioned, the uh, data and skills, uh, data, knowledge and skills for data intensive research. We we do break it down into um, uh, the separate categories that I mentioned in my talk. And I think even if people have a basic understanding, um, so that they're not scared to dive in and um, get some deeper knowledge of these different categories, that um, they can. They can learn more where they need to learn more, but also really crucially maintain their expertise as biologist or hydrologist or whatever their deep expertise is, but still know sort of what are the road signs um, for how I learn more about a particular aspect of, of working with, with data. And um, you were just doing the first part of that question, Kiana? Yeah, because I actually want to elaborate on um, Bob's second part of the question yep. because I have a similar one and it kind of ties into Jill's, which we'll come to after that. Um, so with respect to students, and you, know, you emphasized in your talk the need for these sort of data, data science skills, and I think that students can potentially get that from existing curriculum in different departments and modernized courses. But from the collaboration aspects, I don't think there's that many courses or like this, you know, you mentioned software carpentry that are focused on training students to be effective collaborators. So what are your, what's your advice for training your know, early career scientists and students in those collaboration skills? You know, I, I think one of the most effective models that I've seen, well, I, there's, there's at least two. So let me try to hit them both. Um, so the, the first, I think an easy entry point for students is to get involved with a network like the GLEON network, the Global Lake Ecological Observatory Network, because that's a network that is, um, is very aware that a lot of the people who come to the meetings have never had any, um, any exposure to doing collaborative team science with people outside of their labs and will really kind of walk you through it. Um, so I think that that's one aspect. Um, and, you know, in Gleon, there's certainly lots of other networks that are happening right now um, where students um, or others can just get involved if they're not finding those resources at their universities. But also I think one of the things that we can do as faculty is to think about different models where we're really modeling what collaboration looks like. A lot of us do collaborate across our institutions and so we can really expose that <laughs> to students really expose the structure of what our collaborative research actually looks like and one of the ways to do that um, certainly we can do it as individuals but if we want to do it in a way where we get credit for teaching and the students get credit for taking the course is to develop something called the um, that NCS started, and I think some of the other synthesis centers picked up, which was the distributed graduate um, seminar, where you're running a course at, on the same topic at roughly the same time across multiple universities that may be all, all across the world, and you have similar uh, materials, you know, that you may be all reading about coral reef ecology, um, but then you're using some local data at each of these universities to answer some big question, like what are the effects of warming on coral reef communities? And, um, and you work on it locally and then ultimately have a big synthesis to examine what, are, what does this mean in the big picture when we put it all together. And you know, with a lot of virtual interactions among the universities, 
And I think the, the, the most exciting part of that, I mean, certainly the science that comes out of those is really cool, but I think also for me, it was uh, seeing that the graduate students involved and the undergraduates came away just thinking that this is totally normal way to do science, that it's very productive and there's nothing weird about it. And, uh, and, and can learn some tools like, um, you know, we use now collaboration policies um, that we start off, you know, at the very beginning saying, you know, here's what it takes to be an author. Let's check in early and often to make sure that we understand the authorship policies and, um, and data sharing policies and collaboration policies. And even though it feels awkward for those of us who have traditional training, like, oh, you should just grow organically, um, it helps to head off all kinds of, of conflict that can be quite destructive um, to collaborations. And I think, you know, learning more about some of those, those tools, I think, is, uh, would be really good for, for us as an instructors and, and mentors and to share it with our, with our students, trainees. Okay, thank you. Um, before I go to the next question, I just want to remind the attendees of the audience that you can click on the thumbs up button on questions to help vote for them so you can also help prioritize questions for me to ask Stephanie, given our limited amount of time for the Q&A. So please use that functionality if you can. Um, Stephanie, I don't know if you have much more to add to this. Um, this is a question from Jill Parsons. It's very similar to the collaboration. She first says, um, thank you for a wonderful talk. Can you tell us more about tools available to help scientists collaborate effectively in teams? How do you see these tools enhancing collaboration connection in virtual environments? So beyond kind of training of just our students and so forth, can you touch on anything that maybe you haven't talked about related to that question? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things that we in ecology have probably underutilized compared to a few other fields is um, uh, hackathons and unconferences where, um, you know, rather than focusing on simply, you know, uh, the, you know, a, a scripted kind of uh, agenda and dialogue that we have in standard conferences, we really open it up to think about the conference as a place where we actually get some things done or we have uh, very organic conversations where essentially the entire conference becomes a, a hallway conversation and that we can duck into uh, a room for an afternoon and really you know, work on an analysis together or do a literature review together. So I think that at a larger scale, there are, are tools like that. There are existing models, there are e even software that, that can support those sorts of things. I think that's um, one of the, the tools we could use more. Um, I think those policies um, that I mentioned, they feel so awkward the first time you use them and then, you know, they, are so helpful because you're talking about things before it becomes awkward. <laughs> it's fantastic. Um, but then also, I think one of the things that we see in all collaborations, I mean, I have, I don't think I've ever had a collaboration where we didn't have several members of the collaboration who uh, were primarily bringing a lot of ecosystem specific knowledge and didn't have that, that much programming uh, or data intensive skill sort of experience and we all had to find a balance between you know some of us who are more comfortable with collaboration tools like slack and um, the and our colleagues who would kind of get left behind if we focused everything in one environment and sort of you know we can recognize that there's these great collaboration tools and um, knowing how to strike a balance so that that we're really paying attention to the the people who are primarily bringing system specific knowledge, I think is, is really important. Okay, thank you, Stephanie. Um, it's my understanding that some of the attendees may not be able to see the list of questions. So we're working on that in the background. So I'll just continue to move through um, questions that may be a little bit different than each other and you know, address things related to uh, Stephanie's talk. So um, here's one for anonymous um, submission. 
Do you have advice for pushing back on faculty and researchers in positions of power who demiss the Jedi principles of diversity, inclusion, equity, and justice issues as being secondary um, or a distraction from our science and research? Oh, um, yeah, I have just Hard a one. visceral reaction to <laughs> um, anybody calling that secondary, especially right now. But I totally understand um, that that has, uh, that has been a, a widespread experience, and I hope that we're going to see less of that in the future. Um, I, I, I think some of the advice is um, ad advice that you know we've we've heard from a number of the the speakers um, in in talks about um, you know really finding finding the people who support us. Um, you know that that when administrators or when colleagues push back or call it secondary or whatever, um, that we don't give up, that we maintain some persistence and find others who are like-minded um, through conversations and um, continue to, to bring up these issues in, in various ways and really to take the power in, in the sphere of influence that where, where we have it um, to, you know, I know that's really non-specific advice, but I, I know that, um, that all of our situations are going are gonna to be different. Um, so sort of persistence and finding allies and educating and, um, and allowing ourselves all to be vulnerable and to say a bunch of things that may be wrong, um, but when we're corrected to apologize and learn from it <laughs> and just be willing to have open and honest conversations. Okay, so I'm gonna skim through here and find something that might address a different aspect of your talk, um, except now everything's moving around so quickly. Okay, so wonderful talk, thank you. This is from Natalie Henkoff. I'm not sure if I said her name correctly. You mentioned that you have not collaborated with molecular biologists in the past. What can molecular biologists do to help facilitate collaboration with ecologists in the future to better integrate research across scales? I, th I think we really just need to create some of these venues where we talk about collaboration. Um, and I think just at an institutional level, I, you know, I can't really figure out why I <laughs> haven't. Um, it's interesting that we all seem to, you know, I, I know now from working at NSF and interacting with a lot more with my colleagues in molecular and cellular biology, that we do have, we have really substantial um, jargon differences, cultural differences, and um, and it, the conversations really, you know, they they take longer than you would expect, given that we're all biologists. So um, I think each of us can find ways to have conversations with colleagues that maybe where you know, for a molecular biologist who could maybe find a paper where they think it runs up against ecology and maybe ask their ecology colleagues to read it for ecologists to do the same uh, with molecular biologists and start to look at the places where our fields are kind of colliding or where they should be colliding. Okay, thank you. Uh, here's one that's risen to the top. Now that we can see the thumbs up, the votes. So as the field of socio-ecological systems is growing, I was recently in, it, this is from Jorge Ramos, I was recently in a collaborative group where as I, where as I trained scientists, I brought the, let's all start with the hypothesis question, but other people in the room has historians or engineers or other fields were like, we don't work with questions of the scientific method. Have you had an experience like this and what was the main thread you can find to join everyone together and have these different approaches? Oh, interesting. I have not had this specific experience and I wonder, yeah, I wonder, I'm just sitting here sort of clicking through the um, social scientists and philosophers um, and economists that I've worked with and I, I, yeah, I have not had this specific question. I think, you know, um, what, but I think that a, a tool that I've found that was useful for other aspects of this issue of sort of um, making, helping dialogue to converge um, has been um, 
the oh, it's a philosophical toolbox, and it is um, uh, Sanford Eigenbroda is the second author, and I can't remember the first author right off the top of my head. Um, it'll come to me as soon as we're done. But it's really uh, ask a series of questions that helps you to understand each other's uh, philosophies and goals and how you, um, you know, how, how you're thinking about the question at hand or the topic at hand. And I think that really starting a dialogue with something like that, that it's, is a bit less, you know, sort of focused on the product and the deliverable and more just recognizing we all think differently. We all have different incentive structures. Um, let's let's talk about that first, and then um, you you know you might more quickly come to the place where you find a structure to hang your collaboration on. Okay, with a couple minutes left. I think I'm going to go with a question here that I think you can probably address in a couple minutes. Um, this is from an anonymous contributor. I also wonder how more collaborations can happen between applied scientists and theoretical scientists. There still exists an attitude that those applying the science are not worth collaborating with at higher level science institutions. To me, that is a serious roadblock. Yeah, I mean, that'll be a serious roadblock if we let it be. Um, I mean, so, and, and I, because I think that there is a, there is a widespread appreciation, you know, in the scientific endeavor at large that, um, that convergent research is really built around applied questions, that getting all these different fields focused on a, answering a single massive question is critically important. And I mean, you can really, I mean, if you, you know, one thing is to go look at, at NSF's, uh, it's one of their 10 big ideas, is this kind of convergent research. And so I think that, um, you know, and there's certainly a lot of the leaders in our field who are, are flying the flag for um, more applied research. So I think that, you know, we as individuals can value it and pursue it and um, not worry so much about what other people think about it. And then we, as colleagues to each other, can also make a point of valuing it out loud a lot <laughs> in meetings because ultimately we are the ones who are in control of our tenure and promotion process. Um, so we need to take control of it and be kind of loud and obnoxious about it. <laughs> in a pleasant way. Well, Stephanie, um, I think we just hit the end of the hour. So I really appreciate your answering these questions, providing your insight and perspective and advice to the group. There is quite a few more here. So I apologize to attendees who that we did not get to your questions. Um, I would guess that Stephanie would probably be willing to answer them outside of this platform. So um, again, I want to Thank everyone for attending. You had excellent attendance and, and enjoy the rest of the meeting. Thank you again, Stephanie. Thanks so much.